We've been going through the minor prophets uh, here on our Sunday mornings, and they're called minor prophets because they're like the smaller books. And usually, you know, I think I said last week when we were going through the book of Nahum, I could probably say it again. You know, I told you this will be the best Bible study you've ever heard from Nahum because it's the only Bible study. Maybe Habakkuk could be the same way. Maybe you've heard Bible studies. You've certainly heard some verses from Habakkuk, and we will be looking at those. But almost all of these little books of the Old Testament circle around the same idea over and over and over. And it's the justice of God. So we've been talking a lot about the justice of God. And, and God's justice is not like man's justice at all. And there's a lot of reasons. And I want to, I mentioned this last week and I want to mention it again. And it's key to understanding the book of Habakkuk. We'll talk more about it next week in part two. But there's three areas I really want you to be aware of as to why God's justice looks different than our justice. God sees in ways we don't see. One, God has character in areas of life that we don't have or that we're growing in. Two, and then number three, God has power to work in ways that you and I, no matter how powerful, no matter how rich, no matter how successful, you could be president and you can't change all the things that God can do because of his power. And so when we talk about justice, you've got to see that there is a massive difference between man's justice and God's justice. Ultimately, man's justice is a poor, a poor second to God's justice. We really don't know how to do it. And it's not because, it's, it's not just we're evil, we're bad, we're gross, or anything like that. It's because we're not God. We're incapable of bringing the kind of justice that God is bringing. But oftentimes, and what we're going to look at today in, our, in this book is the way God's bringing justice, for most of us, at, different, at times in our life, it feels like he's not doing anything at all. I don't need you to raise your hand when I say that, but in your own heart, how many of us have said things like, God, where are you? God, where were you? God, why didn't you? God, why did you? God, why not this? God, why this? These are questions that are, are stemming from inside of our hearts because we, we feel like, there's an injustice that's happening and, and God is doing nothing. Or what he is doing isn't in the right direction. Habakkuk was a prophet to the Jews, to the Jews in the southern part of Israel, known as Judah, but just southern Israel. And he was there around the, the early 600 BCs. There won't be a test you don't need to remember. The reason I'm saying that is because when Habakkuk was a prophet, He's speaking to these people and he's saying, um, you know, he's crying out to God, God, when are you going to do something? When are these things going to change? And we know that in about 20 years from the time that Habakkuk wrote these words, massive change occurred in, in southern Israel. The big, the big nation, the kind of superpower that was dominating Israel at the time of Habakkuk was a, a nation called Assyria. But in about 20 years from the time that Habakkuk writes this letter, that's going to shift from Assyria to a, a, a nation that was on the rise up and coming called Babylon in the area of Iraq today. Babylon is going to be rising up and Babylon will absolutely and utterly destroy totally the land of Israel, specifically the nation of Judah. And so they're a significant part. When you read the Old Testament and you hear Babylonians, they were the ones that really just did total destruction to the land of Israel and more specifically to the area of Jerusalem. And so today our, our theme and the theme of the book of Habakkuk is this. Why is there and why does God allow injustice? Why does God allow injustice? And, and you're gonna, you're, the answer will be as disappointing as the question is exciting. Because we're like, oh good, I'm finally going to understand why bad things happen. And at the end you're going to be like, that wasn't an answer. But I promise it'll do something for our hearts. It'll do something for our hearts if we will listen to what Habakkuk is told by God. What's really fun about this letter is it's different than all the other ones. This is a conversation between Habakkuk and God, and then Habakkuk and God. They go back and forth. You ever like, you ever cried out to God and, and was hoping for like an out loud answer? 
Well, somehow Habakkuk got, I don't know if he got an out loud, but he got an answer. And then he's like, I don't like the answer. I have another question. You see, that's a scary thing, isn't it? When you're like, Lord, speak to me. And he does. And you're like, Lord, don't say that. Let's talk. Let's say something else. See, you're supposed to say what I wanted you to say. Why did you say that? You didn't say what. That doesn't sound like the way that I think you should have talked. It's a conversation. So we're going to look at this in a broader context rather than just kind of like one chapter at a time. We're going to try to look at the bigger picture of Habakkuk. It's three chapters, but we're going to, we're going to zoom through and get a good sense of the whole book and why it matters. And then next week we'll continue in a little bit more detail. But Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you violence and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arising. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous and therefore perverse judgment proceeds. I'll stop right there and just make make the statement here. Habakkuk was burdened by the evil around him, the injustices that were surrounding him. God's law, the word of God, the law of Moses, seemed powerless and injustice was reigning around the nation. And remember who he's speaking about. He's not talking about godless, you know, like kind of pagan nations around who worship false gods and all that. He's talking about God's people. He's saying, Lord, why are you allowing injustice in Israel, in Judah, in the land of your people? The the law is, there's lawlessness everywhere. Of course, why, you know, and then he even makes the statement, he says that, like, justice is perverted. Why? Because there's, you can, listen, you cannot have a perfect system where imperfect people created it. It just, it's not possible. You can't have something that's, oh, this is the perfect, it needs no change, it needs no adjustment, it's absolutely perfect. That's not possible because finite, finite sinful people created that. And it needs to be keep on adjusting. And God's law was given by God to man, and even still they weren't able to keep it. And not only that, but they were perverting the laws of God. And Habakkuk feels like God's doing nothing. Don't raise your hand, but here's my question. Don't raise your hand. Because we'll all look at you and judge you, okay? But no, we won't. I'm just kidding. Don't, but don't, you don't need to raise your hand. Let, let me ask you this. Have you ever felt that way? You ever, you ever looked around or forget looking around? You just, you feel like God's doing nothing? And what's the point of just, you know, I'm just going to go to church and read verses and that's supposed to make everything better? I mean, do you think right now that what we're doing is making Ukraine a safer place? Do you think it's better for, for children in, in, in third world countries that are starving today? Do you think just reading the Bible? And this is what happens. Our hearts become very, we, we take an eternal big thing that God is trying to do, but we don't understand it. And we start placing judgment scales upon each one of those things. What good is it me, for me to do what I'm doing right now when this is happening and when this is happening? And then we think going to church isn't solving social problems. But the truth of the matter is that God cares about every human being right now. Every single person, you, but all those people who will never have opportunities like you'll have, God cares about them. And don't for a second think that, that, that you're fired up about the injustices of the world is the first time God's heard this. He's so aware. He cares more deeply than you and I could ever imagine. And I believe in heaven we're going to learn about the, the, the genuine like, heart of God for humanity in ways we never understood on earth. But Habakkuk, and I felt this, I, I feel this all the time. I feel what Habakkuk is saying here. Lord, where are you? Why aren't you doing something? This would be a great time for you to step in and do something. Because if you did, you know, right will come in, justice will prevail, and people will see that you're real. Man, sometimes I just want that. Like, Lord, keep these people from being able to keep talking about how you're not real. Just reveal yourself. And he reminds me, and I hope he reminds each one of us through his word and by his Holy Spirit that he is revealing himself every single day through you, to people, through you. You are the greatest conduit on earth to reveal the heart of a gracious, loving God. Did you know that? Not the person near you, but you. You are the best person. You are the, you are the most fit to reach the people on your sport team, 
in your work environment, in your home? You. God wants to do that through you. So when we say, Lord, why aren't you doing anything? He's like, I am. It's you. And then you, and then you know my next question is, Lord, then you're doing a lousy job because look at me. Look at us. What's going on around here? And so look at what God answers back to Habakkuk, beginning in verse 5, chapter 1. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that's another word for Babylonians, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible. And they are dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. So pay attention to at least part of God's answer to Habakkuk because it might not be what you were hoping to hear and it's definitely not what Habakkuk was hoping to hear. But the answer is important. You see, Habakkuk's wondering how long God is going to delay justice. Why are you letting things continue like they are? And it's safe to assume that Habakkuk is hoping that God is going to judge Israel. He's going to judge his own people. But I think it's also safe to say that Habakkuk wasn't expecting justice to look the way that God was going to bring justice. Habakkuk's like, God, judge these people. They're so evil. And then God's like, I'm sending a foreign nation to come and take over. And they are terrible. And their judgment will be swift. And now Habakkuk takes a step back and he's like, wait, what? Like, I was all spiritual saying, Lord, bring your judgment. I didn't expect that. That's too far, Lord. That's not what I was expecting. These are the things that I'm sure we're going through Habakkuk's head. And in fact, we're going to see that's exactly what he felt. Look at what God said in verse 9 about the Babylonians or the Chaldeans. He said, they come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. You see, Habakkuk's like, wait, hold on, hold on, Lord. I said judgment. I didn't mean annihilation. I want your justice, Lord, but I want your justice to look the way that I think it should look. And then God comes in and he says, no, I'm, I'm going to do something terrible and dreadful. And Habakkuk can't see it. Why? Because he can't see what God sees. God sees what his work will do in their lives for an eternity, not just in that exact moment. And the Lord said to Habakkuk, in your day, you will see. It's coming. And sure enough, within about 20 or so years, this, it's coming. It happens. But you see, Habakkuk can't see justice the way God does because Habakkuk can't see what God sees. And neither can you and neither can I. Secondly, God's character means that he will be more patient with people, more loving, more forgiving, more kind, in ways we'll never be able to comprehend. Anytime I'm feeling super gracious, I think the Lord wants to remind us, like, is, you're just having a good day. Trust me. You're not normally that nice. God is always gracious and always kind. And then third, God has power you and I won't have. You see, I don't care how kind and sympathetic and empathetic and, oh, I just want to help everybody. You can't do it. And I don't mean that to keep you from ever trying to do good because the Bible tells us to do good. We should do good. Here on earth, it's like, it's not a waste to do good. You have opportunity to help somebody, do it. You should do it. It's not like we're like, well, they just need Jesus. They need Jesus through your life. So give them some money, buy them a meal, do whatever you got to do. Help people, love people, be kind. But understand this, no matter what you do, we're limit. we need an eternal, all-powerful God to do the work through us. We can't do it on our own. Habakkuk could not even imagine. When he says, Lord, bring justice, and God's like, okay, I'm bringing the Babylonians, I think Habakkuk's response could have been something like this, and we'll read it in just a minute. It could have been something like this. Lord, your justice is worse than the sin of Israel. What you're going to do to them is even worse. You want to punish them? Lord, your, your punishment's worse than their crime. In fact, look at it, verse 12 of Habakkuk 1 Habakkuk says this to God, Aren't you from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. And you cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Habakkuk is dumbfounded by God's response. Lord, 
Relax a little bit, Lord. I know I was, you know, I think Habakkuk thought he was being super spiritual. Lord, bring your justice. Right? Isn't that what moral, right people would say? A moral person would say, this world is evil and needs to be judged. But then when God comes in, he goes, you're right, and I'm going to destroy. Now the moral person goes, whoa, 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 God, chill. I didn't mean that. You see, it it seems out of proportion from Habakkuk's perspective. I want you to notice something, and I'm just going to sidetrack to this point for a moment because it's been misused by many. Verse 13, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you cannot look on wickedness. This has been way, way, way used out of perspective. Habakkuk means that God is perfect and that he will never accommodate or accept unrighteousness. God is so against unrighteousness that he gave his only son to die for our sins. So when the Bible says here, when Habakkuk says, God, you cannot look on evil, this is not a moral judgment against God seeing or knowing about evil. God knows everything. God sees everything. But he will not allow these things to remain in our lives and in the world that he made. He died for us so that we could have forgiveness of sins. But some people have misused these verses to get the idea that somehow, like, because I'm a Christian, I shouldn't think about, or like, I, you know, if people are talking about, you know, some TV show, it's like, oh, I don't know what that is because I'm a Christian. We got to be pure. Oh, I've never heard that song. Now, you might not have heard the song because you don't like the style of music. But we can make people feel, I've watched this my whole Christian life. I've watched my tribe the, the, the Christian faith make other people feel like they're less than them because they're not as holy or as perfect or as moral as they are. But the truth is, is that's not what God's saying here. In fact, you got to know as a pastor, that's the worst when you're around people. Like when, before, you know, I say BC now, before COVID, BC, um, when we would, I would, we'd go on an airplane and like sit near a, a human being, first of all, and maskless, like think of it. And, uh, you know, and then you start talking to somebody. Now, when I get on the plane, I've always heard pastors talk about, oh, I, I led a person to Christ. When I get on a plane, I want to avoid every human being. I'll just be honest, okay? But if we start talking, you know, the worst thing that could happen in a conversation with me is when they find out what I do. Because all of a sudden, people get all like, you know, oh, now they're super holy and like, you know, oh, I went to church in 2003 and it was a you know, and it, all of a sudden conversations change, kind of ruins good connection. And I think sometimes we forget that, like, our job is not to make people behave better in front of us. Because ultimately we want them to know Christ. I don't want people to behave better. I want them to know Jesus. Behave poorly, but let's get to the heart of what's really happening in your life. I remember after, after 9-11 happened, I was speaking at a church in New Jersey. I'd flown in from Hungary uh, the, right at, like a, a day after when the first flights opened up. We were supposed to be speaking at a church. Obviously, plans changed, but I got to serve as a chaplain down at the World Trade Center area uh, for, for about a week. And I remember like uh, after one of the nights, we were we, me and a buddy, we had been down there, and he's pastoring in New Jersey. We went back to a hotel. It was like 4 in the morning, and we get on the subway, you know, which normally, you know, if you're from New York, you don't really recommend people taking the subway at 4 a.m. I, 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 it's not ideal. But, but we get on there, you know, and some guys came up and wanted to talk, and we're like, oh, boy, it's been a long day, you know. And, and then we pulled out our little chaplain badge. It said chaplain on it. All of a sudden, and, you know, I'm seeing like Catholic sign and I'm, you know, people are like, oh, can you pray for me? You know, everything becomes holy all of a sudden. Why? Because we have an idea that being around a, you know, we have to behave better around Christians. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with being caught and convicted a little bit like I need to, I should be better. That's okay. But you and me as believers, our job is to invite them in to be allowed to be who they are so that the Lord could reach them where they are. Not to make them like feed that monster of be better. Because what ends up happening is that we create behaviorists. People who learn to behave in a certain way around certain people. And we don't want that. Jesus didn't want that. In fact, the very thing that the religious people in Jesus' day hated so much about Jesus was that he let people be exactly who they were. You let sin- you have dinner with sinners. Tax collectors. You see, Jesus' goal has always been and will always be not that he cannot see evil or like, oh, I don't think about that. That's terrible. I've never heard that. Never thought about that. That's not it at all. He said he's so passionate about wanting to love people in righteousness. That's why he gave himself on a cross. 
We have to see the distinctions there. We have to see it. Look at verse 17 of chapter 1. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? Habakkuk is so confused by God's idea of justice. You're just going to let these pagan people come into the land that you gave to your people and they're just going to slay without any mercy. They're just going to destroy us. But Habakkuk has a little ounce of wisdom inside of him. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand my watch and I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say. And I will answer when I am corrected. Verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. We're going to look at that clumping of verses next week. Some of the most significant and important statements in Scripture right in those verses. But I'm setting you up for having to be here next week. Apologies. But we'll look at that in part two of our series in Habakkuk here. God speaks to Habakkuk. He tells Habakkuk, in essence, why he is bringing justice upon the people. And he's more detailed than I imagine Habakkuk expected. He goes on throughout the, the rest of the, this, this second chapter. And even in chapter 1, he said it over and over and over. He's like, and we didn't read the verses, but he says, I'm, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen, and the Babylonians are going to do this bad thing, and then this is going to happen. And Habakkuk's sitting there overwhelmed like, oh my gosh, it's, it's about to be worse than I ever imagined. I think sometimes we say to God things like, God, don't you care? Don't you see the injustice? And if we were, and if God wanted to, and he did it to Habakkuk, and because he did it to Habakkuk, I want you to hear him say this to you and me. Are you ready? This is what he said to Habakkuk, and I need you to hear it for yourself. Habakkuk says, Lord, don't you care about injustice? And God says, I'm about to do something that is terrible. But Lord, you're better than that. Can't you see what's happening? And then God begins to say over and over, I see more than you will ever see. I care more deeply than you will ever care. And I will work in people's lives in ways you will never be a part of on this side of heaven. In other words, when that urge comes inside every single one of us, and I really want to say I commend, I commend Christians today who care about justice and who care about issues that are so pertinent about life today. Because we have, we, we've accommodated a Christianity and it doesn't, and it should not exist and it's not a real kind of Christianity that just says, just go to church, learn verses, and then live in the world. And then one day you get to go to heaven and it doesn't matter. It all matters. This world matters. We're to be in this world. This is our time. But friends, God cares more about justice and about right than you and I will ever be able to in our lifetime. That does not mean you just give up, let go, and let God. That's a terrible statement. Don't do it. It just means remember in all of your pain and sorrow, God feels it more deeply than you. And he has the power to do something about it. You want to see change in the world? You need to tap into your relationship with Jesus in deeper ways. Plain and simple. You want to be a tool for good in the world? Then grow in your relationship with God. And you will, I promise. You will be a mighty tool for good in the world. And then God goes on, and, and I'll just, I'm going to mention them. It's not going to be on the screens, but in verse 9, verse 12, verse 15, and verse 18, God says, woe to this group of people. Woe to this group. It just means like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to judge this group, and I'm going to judge this group, and I'm going to judge this group. And what we're learning is that God sees things that we didn't even know were there. Sometimes we can be like, oh man, this world is so lost. And the Lord's like, you have no idea. You have no idea how lost it really is. And with each issue, God gives greater details. Greed, violence, drunkenness, idolatry, injustice. Things that I'm not even aware of that are happening right around me. God says, I see every bit of it. The last chapter ends with this idea, verse 1, Habakkuk prays. It's a prayer of the prophet. O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, listen to this, remember mercy. In wrath, 
remember mercy. Verse 12, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to the neck. Please notice how this book ends, and then I have a few more thoughts. That don't, don't get really excited just yet. Okay, hold on. It ends with Habakkuk seeing God's heart to save humanity. He goes out. Listen, it ends with this. You go out to save your people with your anointed one. He's speaking about the Messiah, the coming Messiah. In Habakkuk, Jesus was the coming Messiah. Today, 2022, he is the Messiah who has come to the earth and who will one day come again. But please know this. The end of all injustice for God is salvation. We mentioned that last week, that revenge is a terrible substitute for salvation. The ultimate, the ultimate revenge upon injustice in the world is God's gift of salvation. It's the ultimate form of like revenge in a sense. Like you want, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Can you imagine that? Just think about that. And all the injustices, all the injustice going on. I mean, God looks at people right now that we would say, man, they could never get saved. And God's like, challenge accepted. Let's go. Oh, and by the way, you're going to go with me. You're going to be a part of this with me. I'm going to use you. The answer to injustice in the world is God's salvation. It always has been. Ultimate justice is not just a, right being, a wrong being made right, but it's the dead coming to life. It's the dead coming to life. It's what was completely lost being found again. It's not just this was wrong and this was wrong and this was wrong and now it's better. But it's all things that were in darkness, the Bible says, in Christ are made light and life. That is the ultimate expression of justice. And I want you to notice in chapter 3, verse 2, we read it, Habakkuk says, I hear you and I'm afraid. I hear you and I'm afraid. Why? Because he's reminded again that God sees things that Habakkuk does not. If you and I would be brutally honest, it's scary to not be in total control. It's scary to live in a world where the reality is that at any moment, everything could change. Everything can change in a moment. And as much as we like to feel like we're in control, we're not. And so we work hard to control the things that we are in control of because we know that things are out of our control, but then that itself becomes a problem in our lives on its own. Like, most of my life is out of control, so I will micromanage this part. And I said it last week. My boss treats me terrible, so I go home and I am an overlord to my kids. Or this school has been this, or this workplace, or my family treats me this way, so I go and I, you know, or whatever it might be. We look for things that we can control. But friends, the reality is, and what's truly scary, is that life is out of our control. It has to be given over to the hand of God. I believe that self-indignation is oftentimes someone who believes that they have a clear sense of justice. I can't believe this is happening. That can sound like such a, a moral, like there's an injustice that's happening and that self-indignation sounds so right or I can't believe this is allowed. It can sound spiritual, but Habakkuk learned in his own life it was an, the ugly reality was that he wanted to be in control because when God said, I'm about to work, Habakkuk was like, whoa, 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 that's not what I meant. Not that. Lord, things are wrong. Change things. And God's like, okay. And then, wait, wait, hold on. Not like that. You're supposed to be better than that, God. This is very important. Habakkuk did a few things, and I want to I wrap up with, a, with three things that Habakkuk did that I want to encourage you to begin to walk in and to practice in your life, and, in, and I want to do this in my life. Go back to Habakkuk chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and we'll finish up in these, in these verses, or in this verse. Habakkuk said this, when God said, I'm going to do something that is bigger and stronger than you imagine, and Habakkuk's like, this is too much, but he paused and he said, okay, I will stand my watch I will set myself on the rampart and I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Stand my watch 
and set myself on the rampart. These are terms that a guard would have used back in those days. A guard who was protecting the city. To keep watch on the high points around the city. What does it mean from Habakkuk and what does it mean for you and me? To stand watch means I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to change course just because I see injustice and God isn't working the way I expect him to. I'm not going to give up my faith just because things aren't going the way I thought they were supposed to. The common term today, a term I I value very much that we see and hear a lot among many Christians is this idea of deconstructing our faith, right? We're deconstructing our faith. But friends, don't deconstruct a relationship with Jesus. We are to deconstruct all those things that get stuck to the Christian faith that have nothing to do with God at all. And there's so much of those things. There's so many of those. Things that are just a part of our culture. And we're like, this is how the Christians are. And we're like, no, that's not. Pull that off. That was American. Oh, that was Mexican. That was Ethiopian. That was my mom. My mom told me this, and that wasn't the gospel. It was my mom. I love my mom, but she ain't Jesus. If your mom's here, don't look at her and smile, okay? (laughs) But you see what I'm saying? Like, we learn things. We pick up habits. We take things, and we say, this is Christianity. To deconstruct those out of our lives is the healthiest thing you could ever do. But don't give up a relationship with Jesus. I, I, I've said this so many times. I get, I get embarrassed by myself and, other, and the church at times, but I've never been embarrassed of Jesus, ever. He's perfect. He's so loving. He's so kind. What does it mean to stand my watch? It means don't give, don't give up the very thing that saved you, your relationship with Jesus. You want to give up all the other things and give it all up. You ain't going to hurt my feelings. You'll be a better person for it. Get rid of all the junk that comes, that we've collected over the centuries and over the decades and in our culture. Dump it all. Get rid of it. But don't give up Jesus. Don't give up Jesus. Stand, the Bible says, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. Stand against the attacks of the enemy. Don't run away. To set yourself on the rampart, it means to go up on the highest point, to get the better vantage point. And what Habakkuk is saying is this. When I am seeing things from my perspective, I need to elevate my perspective to God's perspective. If I'm not seeing things right, I need to get a better perspective. Do you know how valuable it is in your life when you don't see things? And I, I see this all the time, and I'm watching this happen. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in so many of our lives where if you, if you limit your exposure to Christians to a small, tiny collective, you'll think this is what Christianity is like. But if you allow yourself to be exposed to other Christians, you know, other cultures, other countries, other means of worshiping, other means of looking at the Bible, if you allow yourself to do that, what you end up with is a reality that, man, God is so much bigger than I ever thought possible. He's so much better. Who knew? I thought everybody had to think this way. And you know what happens when we think that way? We feel bad because we don't think that way. And we feel like a lousy Christian. I don't think the way this person thinks and something must be wrong with me. Then you meet other people from other, other, other contexts and you go, wow, that resonates with me and that resonates with me and that doesn't a little bit. And then you go, oh, I don't have to buy in all or nothing. I can just accept God's people and I can love Jesus. And I don't have to be all about the, but you've got to raise your perspective. You stay down too low. You know, it's that, you know, better to shoot for the stars and miss a little bit than shoot for the dirt and hit every time. It's okay to let God raise and elevate your perspective on life and humanity. This was why the Pharisees were unwilling to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Right there. They had their perspective and they didn't spend enough time asking questions from other perspectives. Because they felt like that would be evil or wicked or wrong. And they denied themselves the opportunity to see the Messiah. Because they were too busy doubling down on their own perspective. We don't have to be like that. I will stand my watch and I will set myself on the rampart. And then number three, I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk made some really wise assumptions and I I hope you're getting this. And if you were a note taker, I hope you got those because these are are life-changing things. To stand firm in your faith. You don't got to give it all up in order to find Jesus. Stand firm. Let God elevate your perspective. And then notice what he says here. I believe that God will speak, number one. He says this. Look at what he says in verse one. When God speaks, 
I will watch to see what he says to me. And then when he speaks, he's right and I need to be corrected. Do you know how valuable it is to do that? To not go into a conversation with God and be like, okay, God, I think you're wrong here. But to go in and say, okay, Lord, I'm pretty sure I'm wrong, but show me. I'm pretty sure that I'm wrong. Speak, Lord. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm the worst person, I'm the terrible. No, you don't have to do all that kind of, you know, over-exaggerating of how bad you are. It's just that acknowledgement, oh, wow, when God speaks, I'll be corrected. Whatever he says, it's going to be correcting in my life. So let me wrap up with this, and we'll, we'll, I'll invite the worship team to come back out, and we'll close in worship, but I want to wrap up with these things. You ready? May, remember these. Hold the course. When you see injustice and you feel like things are not, you know, you're ready to give it all up, hold the course. Not the, not the course of, you know, this version of Christianity or this thing, but hold the course with your relationship with Jesus. Don't give that up. Get rid of everything else, but don't give up your relationship with Jesus. It's too valuable. It's so precious. He loves you so much. Don't give that up. You don't understand certain things, that's fine, but don't give, don't give up a relationship with Jesus. Number two, let God elevate your perspective. Let God elevate your perspective. Let, you know, there's, the Bible says there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. Bring people in. Let other people have a voice into your life. Oh, but they've only been a Christian, you know, the same time as I have. What do they know? Let's find out. Let's find out. Bring people in. Elevate your perspective. And then number three, know that God will speak, and when he does, he's right. I remember going to a marriage uh, or like a, a, a premarital counseling, and the pastor was like, he was like, you know, ladies, you guys need to seek the Lord, and husbands, your wife is right. <laughs> I remember him saying that to us. Like, it's like, is that always true? And he's like, yes. Uh, but I want to say this, God is always right. Always. He's always right. Injustice is everywhere, but don't lose your faith in Christ because you feel like nothing's happening. Press in a little bit deeper because the people who press in in their relationship with God will be used to not only bring justice where there is injustice, but the kind of justice God will bring on this earth right now is not just to right a wrong, but to save someone who is dead in their trespasses and sins. You know how God wants to use you to bring justice today? It's through the gospel. It's through the gospel. Let's let him do that through our lives. Father, I thank you so much for your word and the opportunity to be in it today. And uh, to look in the book of Habakkuk and this concept, this idea of injustice. And Lord, we're reminded again, it's an important reminder. It's kind of not the, it's, it's not necessarily the answer we all want, but it's the answer that we all need. That you're, The gospel is the answer to all injustice. Injustice finds Injustice dies where the gospel begins. Help us, Lord. Help us to be vessels of a pure relationship with you. One where we're not in control. You're in control. One where when you speak, you're right, and we're okay with that. Thank you, Lord, that you're, you're real, and you live, and you're alive. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.